Hi everyone, this is Cindy Schmidt and I think we'll go ahead and get started with our webinar this week on land cover classification from satellite imagery. For this course, I'm going to provide an overview of land cover classification, as you know, and how it works. I will not be demonstrating how to acquire Landsat imagery. Um, that's covered in the prerequisite exercise. So all of you should know how to do that. Last week, I provided step-by-step step instruction on how to convert digital numbers to reflectance values, how to clip a Landsat image to a vector shape file, and how to create training sites for a supervised classification. This week, I'm going to show you how to analyze those training sites to improve your land cover map. So more specifically, I'm going to review training site spectral, spectral signatures and then demonstrate an exercise in QGIS on how to create more than one spectral signature for each class and also how to analyze spectral signatures. As I mentioned before, because this course is four hours, the format allows you to do the exercise on your own and ask questions if you run into problems. So first I will review training site spectral characteristics. Okay, so we'll get started with turning data into information. This is a review from last week. Uh, so last week I told you that it's important that you understand the difference between a spectral class and an informational class. A spectral class is a group of pixels that are spectrally similar. An informational class is a land use or land cover class of interest. So image classification is the process of assembling groups of similar pixels into classes that are associated with informational land cover classes. In the images below, image classification has been used to transform the satellite image of Panama on the left to the land cover map on the right. So that's what we'll be doing this week. A supervised classification method requires the analyst to select training areas where they know what is on the ground. Then they digitize a polygon within that area. These known land cover types can be identified through field work or through the visual interpretation of aerial photos or high resolution imagery like um, through Google Earth. Each known area has its own statistical characteristics or spectral signature. The image shows three simplified land cover types, conifers, water, and deciduous vegetation, and their associated spectral signatures. The key to classification, and I can't stress this enough, is understanding spectral variability. Looking at the spectral signatures between vegetation and soil, you can see that it's easy to distinguish between vegetation and soil, but it's much more difficult to distinguish within these broad classes. If you translate the graph on the left to the plot on the right, you can see that some of the vegetation pixels are spread out, but some are quite close together. And this is the same for the soil pixels. So this is what causes confusion within broad land cover classes when you do supervised classification, or any classification for that matter. The spectral signatures from the training areas are then used to categorize each pixel or each segment in the image resulting in the entire image being classified. Sometimes the pixels don't fit the spectral characteristics of the training signatures. In that case, the pixel can remain unclassified. It depends on the algorithm that you use for classification. Um, and we'll discuss that shortly, and we'll also, I'll also be de demonstrating how that works in the um, QGIS exercise today. As a reminder, and I told you, um, you know, I went over this last week, but there are some key characteristics of training sites that you need to know. As a general rule, 
if you are using n bands of data, then you should collect more than 10 times n pixels of training data for each class. In reality, it isn't a huge concern because most people will not bother to determine the total number of pixels for each class. But the point is that you want to make sure you collect an adequate numbers of pixels per class. And some of the next rules will address that. Um, also, I want to mention um, that, you know, ideally you want to get the most number of pixels you can per training class. But then there's some reality, <laughs> reality checks there where if you're doing field work, you can only go to so many field sites. So there's some resource limitations or access. You can't get to these places. Um, so although these are general rules, um, it just depends on the area that you're going to be doing the classification is in. The size of the training site must be large enough to provide accurate pixel values, but not too large to include pixels that don't really belong to that class. It's important to select training sites in various parts of the image, not just one small area. And that's again to capture the full variability of that particular class. It's also important that you have more than one, um, and ideally maybe five to ten, training sites per class. Um, last week we only picked one training site per class, but that was just to kind of show you the process. And lastly, each training site should have fairly homogeneous pixels. The idea with all of these rules is to make sure that you're capturing the variability of each class, but not too much variability. Once training sites are selected, classification algorithms are then used to classify the whole image by comparing spectral characteristics of each pixel to the spectral characteristics of the training sites. So there's lots of different algorithms out, out there, and we discussed a few of them last week. The QGIS plugin has three, minimum distance, max, maximum likelihood, and spectral angle mapping. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing in QGIS this week. The supervised classification process flow involves selecting training sites, editing and evaluating signatures, classifying the image and evaluating the classification. Last week, we selected one training site per land cover class and then classify the image. This week, we will be selecting multiple training sites per class and evaluating and edit training site statistics, and then we'll classify the image. Last week, we defined the macro class as broad land cover categories, as you can see here with the classes as the subcategories. So in this example, we have vegetation as the macro class and grass and trees as the subclass or class as QGIS calls it. This week we're going to do, um, do it a little bit differently. So this week, um, the macro classes will be a little more specific. So they'll kind of be like our classes last week. And then we're going to use the class, the classes, the subclasses, to define multiple training site within each macro class. There's various ways you can do this in QGIS, um, but this was kind of the most straightforward way. So for example, we'll have a water macro class with water one and water two as classes. So they'll both represent that water macro class, but they'll be two different um, regions of interest or, or signatures. And the same with forest and so on. I'll give you a table of all the classes that we're going to identify. After we create the training sites, we will edit and evaluate the signatures. There's many different ways you can do this in, in QGIS, and we're, we're not going to do all of them, but I'll give you a sample of a few and hopefully give you enough information where you can kind of play around with it yourself um, 
in the next several weeks. First, we're going to visually analyze the classification by creating a preview classification, similar to we did, what we did last week. However, this time, the classification will be created using something called the land cover signature classification. So rather than using an algorithm, we're going to use this land cover signature classification. And that uses the statistics of the training sites. So it does it, the minimum and maximum values of the training sites define a spectral threshold for deter determining which pixels be belong to that class. So the preview can be used to determine where you haven't captured all the spectral variability in the image because it won't classify pixels if they don't fit within those thresholds of the signatures. So one way to improve the classification is to change the thresholds of the signatures to include or exclude pixels, and we'll be doing that in today's exercise. We will also analyze the training site statistics by assessing the similarities between the training sites for all the land cover classes. Generally, if there's similarities between classes, then you know you'll be getting some confusion. So then at that point, you have to make some decisions on what to do. Do you edit one of those classes? Do you delete one of the, or one of the signatures? Um, there's, there's lots of different th possibilities. Um, and so as you can see, this is a really very iterative and time-consuming process. Lastly, I do want to remind you to seek out support from all the great QGIS user guides and support networks that are listed here, especially if you're having some general problems with QGIS. And also, don't forget to download the plugin, the SCP plugin manual, to provide you with additional support for the plugin. It's really a great manual, and it has some good tutorials in there as well. Um, so I highly recommend that you download that, that manual. So here we go. We're going to get started um, with our QGIS exercise. So what we're going to do this week is we're going to take um, the image, the Landsat image that we clipped last week to the Calaveras County boundary, and we're going to classify it again. So the only thing you really need from last week, um, we're not going to bring up the new, that project. We're going to create a new project is that Landsat um, Calaveras image. So I'm going to do this all. I don't have anything canned this week. So uh, and I have to do, t I do have to tell you that I ran the classification yesterday just as a practice and QGIS totally crashed on me. So <laughs> it's entirely possible we'll have that happen today, which is fine because then you can see what happens in real life. Um, but we'll just go with it. So I'm going, the first thing I'm going to do is open, get that um, image on here, and it's called Landsat Calaveras. So I'm going to look for it here. There it is. And I'm going to open it. And there it is in its um, crazy colors. So if you remember last week, we used the properties to change the colors on this to make it look better. Um, I'm going to do that again this week just because I like doing it. But uh, on my Mac at home, I figured out um, it's this RGB um, option at the top of the, of the um, plugin it seems to work pretty well with changing the colors. So we'll do it both ways. Oh, somebody just told me that I'm using a very old QGIS version. Yeah, I, 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 um, I believe you're probably right. The problem is um, with software on my computer at work is that I can't install new versions. I have to have my administrative person do that, and um, sometimes that's like uh, pulling teeth. <laughs> so some of you may know what I'm talking about here. So. I'm uh, sticking to this version because one, I know it works, and two, because then I don't have to pull any teeth. So I'm going to change the colors on this. Bring this over here. 
and we'll do it the same way we did last week and then I'll show you the other way. So band, I like this band combination. As I mentioned last week, you can choose any band combination that you want. Some people like to have vegetation as green, which I do. I like to bring in the um, shortwave infrared band and show vegetation as green, but some people like to show it as red. So um, do whatever you prefer. So right now I have band five in the red band, band four in the green band, and band three in the blue band. Um, and somebody just asked, this is the part I had a problem with last week, where do you get the minimum and ma maximum values in the band? So supposedly the, the minimum and maximum values should already appear. Um, and then you, ha you do have to say load here. So it's really important that once you change your band combinations that you press this load button because if you don't, it doesn't get the right minimum and maximum values. Okay. And then you click OK. And I'll wait till it shows up on your screen. There it is. Okay, so there's the image that we're going to work with, with the giant burn scar in the middle. It should be a big purple scar. Um, I think some of you had downloaded a different Landsat image. It's okay if you don't have this exact same Landsat image. Um, the process will still work. I don't want you to have to go back and download uh, a whole nother one. Um, so, for example, the class that we're going to, the burn class that we're going to select here, you may, you won't be able to find that class. So if you have a different image that doesn't have this giant burn scar in it, just um, don't worry about including the burn class that we do in this one. But you can go ahead and do all the other classes. Okay, so at this point, I want to show you the classes. that we're going to be working with because there's a lot more. Okay, so you should be able to see my Word document right now. And this is a table I created. It's in the exercise. Um, I find with, especially when you're doing this, um, this technique in QGIS, to have a table like this, it's really helpful so you don't get mixed up um, with the numbers. You remember which number corresponds to which class and so forth. So as you can see on the left hand side we have um, different macro classes. Um, they're more specific than what we did last week. So we have water, forest, oak, burned area, and for those of you that have a different land, um, Landsat scene, don't worry about including burned area because you don't have a burned area. Um, forest, harvest, and bare ground. Okay, so there's a macro class ID that corresponds to each of those classes. And then the class names will just be the same as the macro class names, but then they have one, two, and three after them. So we have, for example, water, water, one, two, and three, force, one, two, and three, etc. And then the class ID will correspond to that. Um, and so having this table in front of you is really, again, very helpful in trying to remember when you're creating the signatures, um, kind of what class belongs to what number, okay? Okay, now I'm going to go back to QGIS. I'll wait till you see it on your screen there, okay? And we're going to go into the SCP doc. So the way I have my setup um, is I have these two tabs on the bottom. Some people have them kind of floating around. There's different ways you can set up um, this plugin, but I find it easier to have it sort of in these tabs in the bottom. Um, also, I do want to show you this actually, I'll see, we're going to see if this actually works. So if you click on the RGB tab on the top, hopefully you can see it now, um, and you go to uh, 432, yeah, 
yeah, see, it doesn't change. It's funny, when I did it on my Mac last night, it changed it. Uh, oh, you know why? Because I need to put the input image. Okay, so let's put the input image first. So again, if you click on input image and there's nothing there, click the little refresh, and then your input image will show up. Okay. So there it is. It tells it what the input image. Now we'll try and change the band combination. There we go. Okay, so one way to change what you're looking at um, is with this RGB radio button in the panel across the top. This is part of the plugin, which is kind of nice. It makes it easier rather than using properties in the layers panel, but I like using properties. Um, is you can click on that and then you can actually this only has 432 and 321 as the options and I like using as you all know 543 so we can change that if we go into um, tools and I'll wait till that shows up for you okay and then I believe it is not settings. I have to find it now. Tools. Oh, here it is. Okay, if you go to tools in the plugin, and then um, my RGB list was way off to the right, so I just clicked on it next to LCS threshold right here. And then you can actually add an RGB combination. And you do that by clicking on this Add Row. I'm going to wait till you can see that right there. And a little row will show up. And then you can put in 5, let's see. There we go. You have to double click on it. Okay, five, four, three. Okay, I'll wait till you can kind of see that on your screen. And you can see when I actually selected that, my image turned the color in the pack. So now that will be an option for you. Um, I'll close that. And then if I go back up to RGB, I'll wait till you can see that. If I go back up to RGB, that 543 is now there. So I can go between 432 and 543. So whatever you prefer. Okay, so that's a good way to change your band combinations if you don't want to do the properties in the layers panels. So now we have to define a training input. So we're going to click on, we're going to create a new training input by clicking on the new training input. I'm going to navigate to the folder where I'd like this to go. And I'm going to call it Training 2. Training 2. And save that. Okay. So at this point, I would highly recommend that you save um, this project <laughs> because. Last week, as I said, I forgot to save my project, and I, um, and then when my classification crashed, I couldn't bring everything back. So <laughs> I'm going to just call this Calaveras Class Two, and I'll save it. And then we'll save it again after we do all the um, signatures, after we collect all the signatures. Okay, so next we click down here on classification doc. So this should look familiar to you. 
I'll wait till it shows up there for you. This should look familiar because this is what we did last week. However, last week we only collected one um, signature per land cover class. This time we're going to collect three. So I'm going to bring back the Word document just to take a look at it again. So what we're going to do first is we're going to collect three water signatures. So your macro class ID will be one, your class name um, will be water one, and then your class ID will be one. Okay, so we'll do three water classes first. I'll wait till that shows up there. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in to this reservoir right here to get my first water class. I'm not going to go over again all the different ways you can collect signatures since we did that last week, but for all of these signatures, I'm actually just going to use the activate ROI pointer tool that I'm showing you right here. So we're zoomed in. This is a reservoir. We're zoomed into this reservoir. I'm going to activate my pointer. I'm going to click in the middle of the lake. I'm just trying to see if I want to change my, okay, let's just click that. There we go. So remember also, I want you to take a look every time you're selecting a new training area, um, take a look at the distance that's at the top. Um, because if your training site is too small, you'll want to remember to increase that spectral distance. The 0 0.01 right now for the lake is obviously pretty good, so we'll leave it like that. And this will be our first signature. So what we're going to do is go back over to um, the MCID. We know that we want to keep that one. We want to keep the CID as one. We're going to change MC info to water and we're going to change the C info to water one water one uh, hopefully you, you guys can all see that and then we're going to save the signature we'll click click the little save temporary ROI to training input okay and again the signature pops up in the signature list on the top. The color is not what you want the color to be, but don't worry about the color right now. We'll, we'll deal with the color a little bit later. Right now, we're just going to collect signatures. So let's zoom out to the whole image again, and let's collect another signature. We're gonna, there's not a lot of water in this image, as you may notice, um, but there's a few small little lakes. So there's one just to the east of the burn scar. It's right here. I'll wait till you can see that. Zoom in. That's a little lake area just um, to the east of the burn scar. So we're going to click on the activate ROI pointer. We're going to click in the middle of that lake. And that's a nice little training site there, region of interest. Um, the MC ID will stay as 1 because it's still water. The CID will increase as 2. So the C info will want to change from water 1 to water 2. And then we'll save that signature. Okay, so you'll see that pop up on the ROI signature list. We're going to create one more. So I'm going to zoom into another sort of part of a lake that's in right on the border of the image. It's right here. I'll wait till you can see that. And I'm going to again click the pointer, click in the middle of the lake, and there's a training site. Um, and this time we'll call it CID3. So this will switch to water 3 and we'll save that. Okay, so I'll wait till you can see that saved. So by at this point we have three signatures. Uh, again, ideally in a in a real classification, 
you'll want to have more than three even, uh, depending on the size of your image, but we're just going to do three. Um, for the next several um, signatures that I'm going to get, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Um, so let me know if you're missing something or something you don't understand. I'll try to keep an eye on the comments, um, on the questions here. It's kind of hard to do both, but I will try to keep an eye on the questions to make sure I'm not going too fast. But the idea for collecting these training sites um, will be similar across all the classes. So I'm going to zoom back out and I'm going to bring up my Word document again. Wait till you can see that. Okay, so our next class will be forest, so that will be macro class ID 2, and then the class IDs again will be 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to move that. So forest, um, in this case, again, I'll explain what's in this image a little bit. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on in this image. On the, to the west or to the left of the scar is a lower elevation and in California at the lower elevations tend to be more um, oak trees and grasses and chaparral, um, shrubs, that, that sort of thing. And then where the fire occurred is kind of in a, in a transition zone between those oak trees and um, conifers, pine trees. So as you go move east uh, of the fire scar or to the right of the fire scar, you get into more and more and more um, conifers or pine trees at higher and higher elevations. So um, the, as you go to the east, the elevation gets um, greater and greater. So that's just to explain what it is that we're seeing here. So forest, by forest, what I mean is mostly conifers. So I'm going to zoom in to an area that's east of the fire scar. Let's see, we'll go to something like this. I'll wait till you can see that. Okay, so uh, right now I'm going to leave the distance as 0.1, and we're going to select, again, activate the ROI pointer. I'm going to put it into one of the kind of the darker green areas like this and I'll wait till you can see that training site. It's pretty small. So what I'm going to do is actually increase the distance a bit. I'm going to increase it to 0 0.04 and try to get a little bit bigger training site. So the, every time you create a training site with the ROI pointer, it's a temporary training site, so it doesn't save it yet. So you can just create a new one, and it will it'll just do that. So if I use .04, as you can see, I'm going to move this down a little bit. That training site is much bigger, and I think we'll just go ahead and go with that one. So the MCID, when we go back to the left, the ROI creation, should increase to 2, and the CID should decrease to 1. So it should be 2, 1. We change MC info to forest, and we change C info to forest 1, and we save that. Okay. And we'll zoom out. Let's go to a different part of the image. We'll go maybe a little bit um, east of there to get into the higher elevations. Maybe up here. I'll wait till you can see that. There we go. Again, I'll leave the distance as 0.04. I'll click on the pointer. Click in one of the dark areas and there we get a nice um, training site. So the MCID on the left will remain as 2, the CID will, will be 2, and then we'll change C info to forest 2 and save that. Okay, so let's do one more. We'll zoom back out. Let's do one at lower elevations. Thank you. Wait till you can see that. 
Okay. We'll point, put a pointer in there, put it on one of the kind of the darker areas. That's a big training site. We'll leave it like that. We'll call this Forest 3. Save that. Okay. So next, I'm going to bring back my Word document and we'll see what's next. So next we have Oak, Oak 1, 2, and 3. So I'll zoom back out. So as I said before, the oak woodlands tend to be at lower elevation. So I'm going to go to the left or to the um, west of the burn scar to, to pick some different areas there. So I'll do one right here and wait till you can see that. Okay. I'm going to leave the distance at point 0.4 again and we'll click on one of the light areas and there's a it's kind of a small training site but I think we'll leave it at that so your MCID is going to increase to three your CID is going to decrease to one so we have three one and we change the MC info to oak and the C info to oak one and we save that Okay, so let's go to a different area, zoom back out, zoom in maybe a little to this area just east of the reservoir. And wait till you can see that. There we go. Create a, there's a lot of variability here as you can see, a lot of stuff going on. Not all of it is oak. Um, some of the vegetation you see here is probably um, chaparral or shrubs, but we're just going to go with the oak um, and click somewhere in the green area. It's kind of a small training site, but we'll go with it. The MCID and the CID stay the 3, 2. We'll change C info to Oak 2 and save that. Okay, let's make one more. I'm going to zoom back out and zoom in to an area maybe just a little bit south of the burn scar. Wait till you can see that. Okay, we'll select another training site in there. For your purposes, obviously, you don't know this area very well or at all. Um, and, you know, just don't worry too much about the accuracy of what you're doing. You don't have to pick the exact same areas that I'm picking. Um, again, this is just um, an example of how to do this, and I'll show you how to analyze the training sites as well. You will know your area better than anybody, you know, um, and, and, and you can really truly only do supervised classification if you know an area. So this is just for example, don't worry too much about getting the exact area that I'm getting. Okay, so we want to change C info to Oak 3 at this point. Save that. Okay, we've got a few more classes to do, so hopefully you're able to follow along. The next we're going to do is burned area. So for those of you that have a different land sat scene, don't worry about doing this one for burned area because you probably don't have a burned area in there. That's okay because you can just work with the class, the other classes that we have. You'll just have to renumber those macro class IDs to skip the burned area. Okay, so we'll do burned area right now. I'm going to zoom back out. I'm going to zoom into the burned area. Wait till you can see that. Okay, so if you look at this burned area, so all the purple is where the vegetation is burned, and you can see all the different purple colors that we have. So there's a lot of spectral variability, and we want to try to capture that with our training sites. 
Uh, so we're going to click in a couple different areas here. One is kind of this lighter purple area. I'll just click somewhere in here. And, you know, we might want to increase the distance a little bit. I'm going to give that a try. I'm going to increase it to 0 0.08 and do a different training site. Yeah, so that gets a little bit more variability for that particular training site. Um, again, you know, as you can see, this is a very, there's not a hard and fast way to do any of this. You kind of have to understand your area, um, understand, you know, what your training sites, what you're collecting, and then the spectral variability within that training site. So your MC ID is going to increase to four. Your C ID for the first training site will decrease to one. We change MC info to burned. I'm just going to call it burned area. And then your C info, we'll just call it burn one, not brun. Can't spell, sorry. Burn one. My phone is buzzing because uh, there's a emergency flood alert. I'm in California and we're getting a huge rainstorm today. So now there's an emergency flood alert in our area. No worries, we don't have any. I don't think we're going to get flooded out here. Okay, so there's burn one. Let's do another one. And it may be a darker area. So there's some darker purple kind of further north of here, so I'll just pick an area in here. That's a big training site. We'll keep it. We'll call it burn two. Save it. Okay, let's pick one more area. And I'm going to pick um, kind of a shadowy area, I think, like on this side here. Okay, and I will call that burn three. I see there's some questions popping up here. Can we edit the MCID? I forgot to change it. Um, that's a good question. I think what I ended up doing before was deleting um, deleting the signature. If you make a mistake and you save, you know, something that's not the right number. I'm going to first calculate burn three here. Um, so you can delete a signature. You can select it and delete it by clicking on this delete highlighted items and then you can redo it. Yeah, and then I think you can also manually change the values in here as well. I think you can go in here and actually change the values. Okay, I'm going to zoom back out. Our next class will be Forest Harvest. I'll wait till you can see that. Forest Harvest will be number five. Okay, let me show you what that is. So forest harvests are areas um, where mostly private logging companies have gone in and, and logged the conifers. Um, and so you can see it pretty clearly in the imagery. I'm going to zoom in to an area east of the burn scar. So all these little, I'll wait till you can see it. I'll see the zoom. There we go. So all these little pink um, kind of squares and different shapes in there are areas that have been cut um, mostly to private timber companies to cut the conifers. And they cut them in these little squares. 
you can see them, um, there, there's kind of varying levels of colors in here. The pink means it's probably been recently cut, so it's a bare ground. Um, and then some of them you can see some that are where vegetation is growing back. You can see some green in it. And then some of them you can see where there's a lot of green in them where they're probably older cuts um, and a lot of vegetation has grown back. So we're just going to focus on um, the bare ground areas for our forest harvest. So I'm going to collect a few training sites in here. They're going to be small um, because they're small areas. So there's our first one. And our MCID will increase to five. Our CID will go down to one. We'll call this forest harvest. And our CIE info will be harvest one. So as you can see this week, you know, by the more signatures you collect, sort of the longer process it is. And I'm going through this pretty quickly. You definitely want to take your time with this because you'll see later how the signatures, um, I, although we'll be able to edit the signatures later, later um, but collecting signatures is a really important part of doing the supervised classification. I'm going to collect another one just in the same area. I'll call this Harvest 2. And then I'm going to collect one more, maybe off to the west of here, way over here. And I'll call that Harvest 3 and save. So we're getting a lot of signatures here. Okay, almost done. Our last one, I'll bring up the Word document again. is our last one is bare ground. So we have um, as our class six. So I'm going to zoom back out. We're going to zoom in. So most of the bare ground, except for the forest harvest there, so you can imagine there's going to be some confusions between the bare ground and the forest harvest, but we're going to go with it. Um, our, most of our bare ground is to the west of the fire scar, kind of near that reservoir where you can see all that kind of pink and white. So we're going to zoom in to that area. And wait till you can see that. Okay. So you see a lot of different colors here. So we're going to pick just an area. I'm going to pick one of the white areas right now. And we have our distance at 0.08, so it's getting quite a few pixels. We'll leave it. We'll leave it at that. That's fine. So the MCID increases to 6. The CID goes back down to 1. We're calling this bare ground. And we'll call it C info will be bare one and we save it. Okay, let's pick one of the pink areas, maybe like here. Oops, we'll pick this first. Pink areas, maybe like here. Oh, it's another big one. Let's just keep it. This is 6 2, so we'll call it bear 2. And the last one, let's move a little bit further this way. And wait till you can see what I just did. Okay. And we'll pick one over here somewhere. Okay. It's our final training site. These are very large training sites, by the way. I would probably normally decrease the distance. And this is bear three. Okay, so at this point, 
you should have, unless you don't have a burn scar, you should have 18 spectral signatures. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to sort of analyze our signatures and see where we need to make some improvements. So I'm going to zoom back out and we're going to first use um, the preview classification. So we did that last week to, to look at our um, signatures. We're going to use that preview classification to take a look at um, how we did with collecting signatures. So first what we're going to do is um, choose colors for our preview um, classification. So in order to do that, um, below ROI creation, oh, first of all, before we even do that, I want you to save your project. So everybody just go ahead and save it right now because you've created all these signatures. Um, if something happens, we don't want to lose um, those signatures. So I'm saving it. Okay, now we're going to, um, below ROI creation, we're going to click micro, macro classes. And so when you click on macro classes, you can see those macro classes show up and we're going to change, this is where we're going to change the colors. So you can classify this by your class or your macro class. So last week we did, did class, this week we're going to do macro class. So we're going to change the color by by double clicking on the color box and I get this kind of um, color table that shows up. I know on my Mac I have um, a variety of options and probably on more current versions of QGIS you may have um, different options too. But for water, we're going to make water blue. That makes sense. We're going to change forest. Let's make that a dark green. We're going to make the oak a light green. You can choose any colors you want for this too. I'm generally pretty bad at choosing colors, so you may not want to follow what I do. Um, burned area. We're going to make, let's make it purple. We'll make it a dark purple. Um, forest harvest, let's make that orange. And then bare ground, let's make that a light yellow. Okay, so you should have your colors set there. Next, we want to select below the macro classes, we want to select classification algorithm. Now, wait till you can see that. And then once we do that, you can see where it says use MCID or CID. Make sure MCID is selected. We aren't going to be using um, an algorithm at this point, although just um, for the future, we're going to be changing that. When we do use the algorithm, we're going to use maximum likelihood. What we are going to be using is the land cover signature classification located below the algorithm. So where it says use LCS, make sure that LCS is selected don't select algorithm at this point. So what we're doing is we're basically checking to see um, which pixels fall into the, the spectral signatures that we created um, and which pixels do not. So how, did, how well did we do at capturing variability in our image? Okay, that's what we're doing with this. 
So next we'll go up to the preview. If you remember right, the preview is up here on the upper right. We want to increase the S to 500. Right now it's set at 200. I'm going to increase it to 500. And then you're going to click on the Activate Classification Preview Pointer. And what we're going to do at this point is click somewhere just to the um, east of the reservoir. Just to the right of that big reservoir. So I'm going to click that. And it'll take just a second here. And hopefully it doesn't freeze up. Oh, it's freezing a little bit. There we go. And, and now you can see my preview classification. So I'm going to zoom into that. I'm going to kind of zoom in around the lake. We're going to take a look at that. Actually, I'm going to zoom in even a little bit. Well, that's probably good enough. So when I zoom in, let's take a look at what we see here. We see um, the blue pixels where there's lakes, obviously. We see a lot of light green. Um, which is the oak. We see a lot of yellow, which is the bare ground. Um, we see a lot of black. There's a lot of black, which means there's lots of pixels that have not been classified. Um, and then we see some gray where there's a lot of overlap between the pixels. Okay, so let's figure out some ways to, um, to deal with some of the black first. So if you click on and off the preview, so let's focus on the lake first. If you click off the preview, and then you click on the preview, what you'll notice is, and I'm going to put my cursor in this area right here. I'm going to wait till you can see that. Some of the lake, some of the water in the lake did not get classified. There's black there. Actually, there's some purple there too, but um, some of the lake did not get classified. So let's figure out how to include those water pixels as part of the water signature. So I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit further to that area that I'm talking about. Okay. I'll wait till you can see that. And I'm going to click on and off the preview again so you can see this area. So I'm going to try to point it out a little bit. There's, um, there it is clicked off, and there it is clicked back on. Right. So there's some area in here um, that should be water, but it's not classified as water. So in order to classify that area as water, I'm going to click back off the preview. And I'm going to make an ROI in the area where we want to include as part of the um, as part of the water. So I'm going to just make an ROI like right here in this little area. Okay, so what happens because my distance is fairly big is, and this is fine, you can do it this way. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can create this ROI with a bigger distance. So that will, that, as you can see now, it's including a lot of those sort of edge pixels. So. Um, the reason why it wasn't included in that signature is because when I clicked on the lake, I clicked in the middle of the lake, and it's deeper there. On the edges, it's shallower, so you're seeing um, some sediment. Um, and because my spectral distance was, was smaller with the water originally, it didn't include those shallower areas. So now if we increase the spectral distance, it includes those shallower areas. You can see that. So this is one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is you can, um, and I, I'm not finished yet, but I'm just showing you a different way you can actually do the, um, change the values for this signature, is if you decrease the distance to 0.01 and you select 
and you create another ROI. So it only gets a small area. You can do it this way as well, okay? So what we do at this point, we're going to bring up another box. We're going to bring up, um, it's called the spectral signature plot. And in order to look at the spectral signatures more carefully, what we have to do is highlight those signatures first. Um, I think in the exercise, there's actually a typo here. It's on page seven, um, and we're at the part where it says highlight three bare ground signatures in the ROI, um, kind of halfway down, a little below halfway down. What we want to do is, oh, it might not be page seven for you guys, actually. Mine's a little bit different. But at this part in the signature, it says highlight bare ground signatures. And what we actually want to do is highlight the water signatures. Um, I'll make that change in the exercise and make sure we get the updated version on the website. Apologize for that. So we're going to highlight the water signatures by just clicking and dragging down so they're highlighted in blue. So hopefully you can all see that. Then you're going to click on this little icon below that says add highlighted signatures to spectral sign. Oh, thank you, Pedro. Page 11 and 12, not page 7 is where this is happening, where um, it's in the exercise. So we're going to click, we're going to click on the spectral signature plot. And there's lots of stuff going on here, <laughs> as you can see. Okay, at the top of this spectral signature plot is the signature list. So we're looking at those three signatures that we just highlighted, the three water signatures. And what we're seeing is the minimum and maximum values as you scroll across in each of the bands. So band 1, band 2, band 3, band 4, band 5, band 6. Okay, so those give you some statistics. Um, we'll talk about the colors in a minute, don't worry about those. Okay, below the signature list, there's a plot. And my plots tend to be um, really funny in terms of how they scale. You can zoom in and out, um, but essentially what we're seeing on the x-axis is the wavelength, um, and the band number is actually in the dotted lines. So we have band 1, band 2, band 3, band 4, band 5, band 6 in the dotted lines. Um, and then the values on the y-axis are the pixel values. Uh, you can zoom in. if. For me, I just zoom in using a, my, the scroll on my mouse, and I can zoom in. Okay, if you zoom in way in, you can start to see the signatures a little bit better. Um, it's hard to notice on these, on the water signatures, because there's not much variation across the bands in the water signature. As you can see, it's very straight. Um, but this plot, if you zoom way in, and I'm actually, you can turn on and off these particular lines for each signature by going to the signature list and clicking clicking on and off the check mark and boxes under S. So if we're, if right now I'm only looking at one of the signatures, and you can see in my um, graph right here, there's like a green line, and then on either side, there's kind of a shaded area. So the, that shaded area shows you the minimum and maximum values of that particular um, signature. You can turn that those shaded values off and on in the plot by clicking on and off the plot value range below the plot. So if you click that off, do you see the shaded values go away and you just see the signature itself? Or you can turn it back on. Right now, we're not going to um, really work with this plot very much. It's good when you start looking at comparing other signatures to each other. Um, and there's a way to actually adjust the threshold of your signatures through this plot. But I'm going to show you some other ways to do that. So let's click on all three signatures again. Okay, so to the right of this signature list, there's all kinds of icons. Um, and what we're going to be looking at is automatic thresholds. 
So you can change the minimum and maximum threshold of your signature by these tools right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the threshold using the ROI that we just created. So where it says from ROI, that's what we're going to use. But let me explain the other things that we're seeing here first. We have the from ROI where you can use a region of interest um, to change the thresholds. Or you can do it from an individual pixel. If, if you just want to change um, the thresholds based on a pixel, a specific pixel, you can do that as well. Now it's really important that you understand what the plus and minus are because I messed around with this earlier um, and um, it, it really changes the values of your minimum and maximum. So by having the plus checked, that means that whatever the ROI that you selected to change your threshold will be added to your um, current boundaries, your current thresholds for that signature. If you select the minus, that means those values will be taken out of your, um, so it's a way of making signatures smaller. So for example, if you had a training site that included way too much stuff, you can actually tell it what you want to exclude, okay? We're going to include, we want to increase the water um, to include that shoreline area, so we're going to keep the plus checked, okay? And then we're going to actually select um, one of the signatures, and if you remember right, the first signature was actually that lake, um, the water signature, the water ROI, so we're going to select that, okay, and then we're going to click, make sure the plus is clicked, and then we're going to click from ROI. Okay, so that will change um, the minimum and maximum values for that ROI to hopefully include those areas that um, were excluded before. So now we're going to kind of check. We're going to check on how well we did there and make sure I did it right. So at this point, we're going to close. I'm going to close the spectral signature plot. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, I'll zoom out a little bit here. And then I'm going to do the preview again, the preview classification. Okay, so when I click on preview classification, the old classification comes up. So you can get rid of that old preview classification by clicking on this trash can that's to the right of that number 500, and it says remove temporary files. So you can click on that trash can, and it will go away. So now let's create a new um, preview classification and see if we captured, um, if we did better with the water. So I'm going to click on the preview. I'm going to click maybe just to the right of the lake a little bit. And I'm going to wait. Okay, and as you can see, the, um, the ROI is still on there, so to turn that off, I'm just going to click off the ROI button, okay? And then I'm going to zoom in to see how well I did. So it looks like uh, I did much better by including those pixels as part of the threshold for that one signature, I was able to um, include that shoreline, that sort of more shallow area of the lake as part of that um, water signature. So this is just one really um, effective method in this plugin, um, how you can sort of adjust those signature thresholds to include what you want to include. Okay, that's, that's the first one. So next, I'm going to zoom out a little bit more. And we're going to kind of zero in on 
an area that's to the left of the lake, kind of to the north left of the lake. Actually, I'm going to zoom out a little bit more so you can see that. So you see some black areas, and the area that I'm looking at, I'm going to click off the preview. Okay, so the area I'm looking at is is right here. Hopefully you can see what I'm pointing at. It's This is an urban area, so it's a small town located sort of north, a little bit west of the reservoir. And you can see more urban areas located just a little bit south of that. And, uh, and then you see kind of a really light green area that that's like almost in a circle shape. That's actually a golf course. So you can tell that's a, that's a populated area. But if you click the preview back on, you notice that those areas are not classified. So what that says to me is that we need to create a new class. Um, and we'll call it an urban class. OK, so, uh, so that's where this preview classification can be really effective because um, it can tell you what kinds of classes, what kind of spectral variability that you're missing in your classification. And in, the, in my case, I'm missing urban. So I'm going to make a new ROI. I'm going to turn off my preview again. I'm going to zoom in to the urban area like this. I noticed somebody was asking, can we make a new signature water for water five? Yeah, so um, going back to the water by adding, um, changing the spectral thresholds of that one signature, that's one way of doing it. But another way of doing it is adding a new signature. Absolutely, you can make a water five signature. Um, it does essentially the same thing. So I'm going to create a new class. Um, first, I'm going to create the ROI. So I'll activate the pointer. Um, I'm guessing my distance at point 0.01 probably is not um, big enough because as you can see in this urban area, there's a lot of spectral variability. But I'm going to just see what happens. Yeah, so if I just choose point 0.01 uh, as my distance, it gets like two pixels. So I definitely want to increase. I'm going to increase it to 0.08, and we'll try it again. So as you can see, you know, this is a really iterative process. There we go. If we do 0.08, that training site um, seems to work out a little bit better. So we're creating a new class. If you remember right, our um, our bear class was our last one. It was MCID as six. So we're going to call urban seven. So we'll change our MCID to seven. We'll do CID as one. We call MC info as urban and C info as urban one. And we add that. So let's just do a few more urban signatures. I think that would be a good idea here. Um, we can move just maybe south of there where we see that golf course. I'm not going to include the golf course um, because obviously that's vegetated. So let's try another area here. And we collect another urban signature and we'll call it urban two. Save it. And let's find one more. Let's find one more. I think there's one over here. Here we go. See, this is another urban area, but there's a lot of vegetation in there. But we'll try to get a good training site here. Yeah, I think that's a little big. I don't like that training site. I'm going to pick another one. How about this one? See, that's that's too big. So I'm going to increase decrease the distance to maybe 0.04. Try it again. 
Uh, let's do this. Okay. That's small, but that's better than the other one, which seemed too big to me. And we'll call that Urban 3. Of course, if you were doing this, you would have a lot better idea of what was on the ground. Urban 3. All right, so let's take a look at it, how well we classified the urban. Let me zoom back out. And I'm going to do the classification preview again. Um, I want to trash that one that I just did. So I'll get rid of that one. And we'll create a new one. And let's see if we got that urban. I'm going to... Let's do it right in here. Okay, I'm going to zoom in. Oh, you know what? I forgot to change the color. I'm going to go see what color my urban is. Okay, so the urban is actually like a green color. I'm going to change that to just so I can distinguish it from everything else. <clears throat> I'm going to change it to a light purple. Um, I'm going to trash that preview and I'm going to do another one. Okay. So let's zoom in and see what we have. Okay, so it looks like we've captured some of the urban anyway, and probably more than we wanted. But there we go. So if I click off the preview, I'm waiting until you can see that. And then you can see where that urban is, and then click it back on. You can see um, that I got, you know, I got some of the urban area. So here's the thing with urban. Urban is extremely variable. Um, it has a lot of spectral variability, and it gets confused with everything. So, and we'll, you'll see this later when we start looking at the statistics a little bit more. So. Once I define an urban class, you'll see it appearing everywhere. And as you can see, it's appearing along the lake edge, as is, I noticed, some of the burn, um, the burn area. So burn is obviously getting um, mixed up with a lot of things. So you're starting, you start to get an idea of what spectral classes are getting confused with what. Um, but this are get, just giving you some techniques on how to include classes or, um, you know, work with the confusion. The next thing I, I want to show you is how to deal with clouds. So I'm going to uh, zoom back out. We actually, it's hard to see them here. I'm going to turn off the preview for a moment. Um, but there are a couple small clouds in this image. And they are located um, to the east of the burn scar. And you can see a pretty good one right here. I'm going to zoom into it. I'll wait till you can see that. Okay, so you can see the little white cloud puff um, and a couple other cloud puffs, and you can see its shadow as well. So the best thing to do with clouds, um, sometimes you can make um, a cloud mask ahead of time, and you can actually pull out those pixels. Um, one of the, the other way you can do it is just have clouds as a separate class. So then we would just pick an ROI. Um, in that cloud region. Oh, great. Mateus uh, said, isn't it a good idea to save the project again? Great idea. We're going to do that right now. We're going to save it. 
always save this because you never know when things are going to crash. Um, I'm going to make another cloud signature. So the one, the reason I'm showing you this is because clouds are really variable. So I have a distance set at 0.04 right now, and I just created a training site, and it's really, really small. It's obviously not getting the whole cloud. So we're going to increase the distance. Let's go to 0.8 and try it again. Uh, so that gets a little bit more of the cloud. I'm actually going to go to point one and see what happens here. And do another one. Yeah, it's um, clouds are tough. So I, it looks like there's sort of two separate areas in here. So the way you can deal with this is either have two separate training sites. You can have this one, or you can just keep increasing your distance until you get the whole cloud. Or, yes, oh, you know what, that's a great idea, Pedro. Or, even better, use the polygon ROI. Um, I, the spectral one is really good for you to really understand how much spectral variability in there, but using the polygon ROI will capture all that so, for you. So we'll do that right now. We'll do this, this, this. I'm not even sure if I got it all. I pro probably could do a better job at that. But um, if you remember right, if you do three corners and the fourth one, you can right click um, and it, it will close your polygon. So well, let's go back to ROI creation. This can be class eight. MCID is eight. CID is one. We'll call it cloud and then we'll call it cloud one. Okay. And save that. I'm only going to do one just for the sake of time here. Um, you might also want to do that with a shadow. Um, the, I just will warn you that your shadows are going to get mixed up with a lot of other shadows um, and other things as well. So it might get mixed up with some burn will probably get mixed up with your north facing slopes. So even in this particular image that we're looking at, you can see some of the shadows um, just north of the shadow um, that it will probably get confused with. Um, so you can give it a try by creating a new class if you want with shadows. Um, but my guess is that it will get confused with a lot of stuff. Um, and there's not much you can do about clouds and cloud shadow. Um, it's not like you can see underneath the image. You can Sometimes what people do is they'll fill in with, an, with a different date image. You can do that if you have that imagery available. Um, but then you have to realize that you have multi-dates in your image. So there's clouds are tough. Luckily, there's very few clouds in this particular image. Um, hopefully, you're area of interest isn't underneath that cloud. Okay, so I'm just going to leave the one cloud. Um, so next, what we're going to do is sort of analyze the signatures a bit. I want to show you um, how you can look at these signatures in different ways. So at this point, what we're going to do is open up this um, Oh, well, for, actually, sorry. First, what we want to do is highlight all the signatures. So let's highlight all of them, all the way down. So make sure that they're all in blue, and then we'll open up that plot again. I'm going to make this box pretty big so you can see everything. So as you can see, our plot is crazy. It's got all kinds of um, spectral values in there, or spectral signatures. It's got all of them. Um, if you wanted to look at individual ones, then you would check them off and on on the signature list on the top, as I showed you before. Um, you can see one signature that's way at the top here. That's probably your cloud signature. Um, that because that's going to be really different than and very high uh, reflectance value compared to everything else that you have. Um, again, if you if you can look at the minimum maximum values of your signatures in the signature list. Now, what's really valuable here is 
this column that has the colors in it. So most of you will probably have to expand that column a bit. So just expand it open. And this is, uh, this is really great because it tells you which signatures overlap spectrally with other signatures. Okay, so everything that you see highlighted in orange here is an overlap with other signatures. So as I scroll down, you'll see a lot of orange. Now, lots of times, the signatures are just um, overlap with each other, which is fine because they all belong to one class, right, or one ma macro class. But um, if you look in the column where it says color and the overlap, you'll see some numbers there and it actually tells you which signatures that it overlaps with. So for example, in, in mine right here, what it says is my forest one signature overlaps with signature four two. And four two is actually burned area. It's one of my burn signatures. Um, and it looks to me like that burn signature is, gets um, overlapped with all my four signatures. So that's just something to keep in mind. Let me scroll down and see what else is being confused. Okay, my oak is being confused with something that I can't see, but we'll, I'll be able to show you another way to look at this in a minute. Okay, so my burned areas are one of them's getting confused with urban, one of them's getting confused with my forest classes, as we saw before. A couple, couple of them are actually. Um, harvest is getting confused with bare ground, and that makes sense, right? Because the the harvest um, signatures that we selected were actually bare ground, so that makes a lot of sense. And as you scroll down, you can see some which signatures, like urban, again, gets confused with everything. Um, so this shows you that is, in fact, true. <laughs> so this is one way to look at how signatures are confused with each other. The other thing you can look at is to look at the standard deviations of these signatures. And the way you look at that is you click below the plot, it says signature details. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna select that. I'll wait till you can see that. I'm gonna scroll all the way up to the top and explain what we're seeing here. So for each signature, we have um, the MCID1, MC info is water, so we're looking at the water one signatures. And then it gives you the size of your ROI. In this case, the my first signature had 2,511 pixels. And it tells you the standard deviation for each band. So this is interesting to look at, especially across your different um, signatures. And if you have a particularly high standard deviation, that means there's a lot of variable variability in that particular signature. And you may want to consider deleting that signature and either redoing it um, or, uh, or just deleting it altogether from your classification. Um, so this just gives you a way to really dig into, for those of you especially that look, like to look at numbers instead of graphs, um, this is a really good way to look at your standard deviations. Um, and if we scroll down to urban, so you'll see a lot of these standard deviations as 0 .00 something or other, um, which is you know pretty pretty low. Some are a little bit higher than that. Um, if I scroll down to urban, so you're going to see these standard deviations is higher, right? So it's 0 .02, 0 .02, 0 .01. Um, Part of the reason is because we had increased that distance um, quite a bit, I think, to 0.08, and that includes a, a higher number of pixels. So by definition, when you increase that distance, your standard deviation is going to be higher. But this gives you the exact number. Um, so if you have one particular um, 
especially if you've created an ROI with um, the polygon tool as opposed to the spectral um, pointer, then you really want to take a look at the standard deviations to see if you've included, if there's too much deviation um, um, heterogeneity in your pixels. Okay, So this is just one tool you can use. So somebody was asking, what does the distance stand for? So I explained that last week. Um, so I am assuming you mean the distance in the ROI. That's the spectral distance. So that's the distance in the values between the pixels. Um, and in this case, since we converted our image from um, pixel values to reflectance, our values range between 0 and 1. So your distances are going to be really small. So it's just the distance is the, is the difference between the pixel values. OK, then the last thing um, that we want to look at is um, the, the spectral distances. There are various measures, um, various measures of spectral distances. And it gives you an idea, again, of which signatures are overlapped with each other. So to look at those spectral distances, you want to highlight all the signatures in the signature list first. Make sure you highlight everything. Then uh, to the right of the signature list, there's um, an icon that's Calculate Spectral Distances. So click on that. And what will happen is below signature details, spectral distances will pop up. And it's kind of scrolled at the bottom, so I'm going to scroll all the way to the top. So there are four different measures of distance, um, and they're really they're measures of separability. How separate are signatures from each other? Okay, so we have this first one, the Jeffries Matsu Matusita distance, um, which is very useful if you're doing a maximum likelihood ca classification. So zero means the signatures are exactly the same, and two means they're different. Um, there's the spectral angle distance, um, and zero means they're identical, and 90 means they're totally different. Um, and Euclidean distance is listed there, and then Bray Curtis similarity, where zero is different, 100 is absolutely identical. Um, and so that last one is sort of useful for general. So they're, they're all kind of indicators of how similar your um, your signatures are to each other. So of course, if you're looking at the same signature within, um, you know, two, two signatures within one larger class, you're going to expect them to be similar. If they're not similar, that's not a big deal because that may mean that you're capturing variability of that class. It's just something you, you want to check on and you want to assess. So, um, the other thing that this uh, algorithm does is it tells you that everything in red um, means that those signatures for those measures are particularly similar. So probably the first thing you want to do is sort of scroll down and see what's in red. I'm going to scroll down and see. OK, so here's one. Uh, three out of the four distances, um, and it's water, it's my two water signatures, water two and water three, it's comparing. So I'm not too concerned that those signatures are similar since they're in the same water class. So I'm going to keep, the ones I'd be more concerned with are really um, between classes, between the MC classes, the master classes. So I'm going to scroll down. I'm doing this kind of quickly, but I'm just looking at this point, I'm looking for the red as an indicator of what might be confused with what. Oh, here's one. Okay. A couple more. Oh, forest one and forest two. Okay, I'm not again, I'm not too concerned about that. Forest one and forest three. That just means they're very similar. That's fine. I'll continue. We have a lot of classes, so or a lot of signatures, so that's why I'm Scrolling down through all this. Here's another one, force two and force three. That's fine. 
I'm going to keep scrolling down. Okay, here's a couple. So it looks like, at least for two of the measures, my Forest 3 signature and my Oak 1 and Oak 2 signatures are similar. So that's just something that there might be some overlap and some confusion, um, depending on what classification method you use. I'm guessing I'm going to scroll all the way down to urban um, because urban, as I said before, gets mixed with everything. So let's, I'm going to scroll all the way down to urban. Our burn is getting mixed with a lot of things too, I noticed. Okay, here's some urban. Urban one is mixed with burn. Let's see what else is going on. Harvest and bear, of course, are confused. We saw that earlier. Urban two and harvest. Yeah, so, you know, the, the thing that you do with this is really assess the similarities between these classes. And if you're seeing, for example, similarities across all these different distances, you may consider, again, either um, redoing a particular signature, you can delete signatures, um, you may have to sort of rethink your classification. There's other ways that you can deal um, with some of these issues. Uh, I think I told you last week, sometimes when there's to minimize confusion between classes, you can divide up your study area by ecoregions, for example, um, or by elevation, because sometimes you'll have um, some features at some elevations and not at other elevations, so it's a good way to sort of separate out those areas and then classify them separately. Um, somebody asked, can we just manipulate the distances to separate them? Yes, I mean, and I showed you ways you can manipulate those dis distances, but sometimes you have classes that are just too similar, um, and there's no getting around it because we're only looked at looking at spectral um, spectral values here. You can merge classes, somebody mentioned that. You can, but you have to be careful about that because um, if you're merging, it just depends on the goal of your project. If you're merging urban and bear, for example, because they're getting confused, um, then what do you call that and how useful is that for your final classification? Um, you know, for, for your client or for your work or whoever you're doing that for. So doing a purely spectral classification is really challenging. I, I think um, most people who have higher accuracies in doing land cover class, classifications awful, often will bring in ancillary data um, to help them deal with some of these confusion issues. Oh yeah, somebody was mentioning you can merge um, you can merge your spectral classes absolutely. So you can um, you can go back um, into your classification, your signature list, and if there are class if there are signatures that are particularly similar to each other, you can um, you can actually merge them together into one signature. That's another option that you can do. There's all kinds of different things. So at this point, what I'm going to do, I'm going to save my project again, just for the heck of it. I'm going to zoom back out. And I'm actually going to run the classification as is. I'm not going to make any more changes, um, even though I clearly need to. So at this point, uh, we'll keep the Actually, what we'll do is we'll change the cloud under MCID. We'll change the cloud cover to white. We'll say OK. Um, we'll keep all our colors the same then. Um, if we click on classification algorithm, again, we want to use the MCID. Um, we will use, this time we are going to use the algorithm because we want to um, classify every pixel. So if you don't choose the algorithm and you only choose use LCS, 
it will only classify those pixels that fit into your um, the thresholds of your statistics. If you use the algorithm, it kind of does like a hybrid classification where it will use maximum likelihood or whatever algorithm you choose to figure out where those unclassified pixels should go. So it uses a statistical approach to figure that out. So it will classify all your pixels. So we're going to do it that way. Um, select use LCS, select the algorithm, okay, and then click on classification output. And I'm going to click run. I'm going to give it a name and I'll call it uh, Calaveras, oops, Cal I can't spell, Calaveras class two. So this is our second class. And we'll call it save. And let's see if we can run it without crashing. Yesterday it crashed. So this takes a little while to run. So at this point, what I'm going to do is let it run. It's stalled right now. And um, because really the important part of this whole thing, I, I've showed you already, the classification will just be, you know, the result of all of this manipulation that we've done with the signatures. So I'm going to let you... Um, Go ahead, for those of you that want to stay, um, stay with me, go ahead and run through it there yourselves if you haven't done so already, and then I'll be here to answer any questions. And I'll kind of look back and see if I've, what questions I've missed as well. So mine's still running, although it says not responding. It kind of goes back and forth. I don't know about yours, but mine goes back and forth between not, not responding and then responding. and. Okay, so I'm going to look at some of these questions. Oh, somebody, I think I answered this question, but somebody asks, what does it mean if Urban 1, Urban 2, and Urban 3 do not overlap? Um, so that could be good in a way, because if they are not, uh-oh, I think we just crashed. Yeah. I think I just crashed it. So... Uh, uh, I don't know why. Um, so I think I have a classification that I can bring up for you if you're interested in it. Um, I'm curious to know when you guys run it if you uh, are able to successfully <laughs> run it without without crashing it because this happened to me yesterday. Yeah, somebody said maybe it's a memory problem. It's entirely possible. Um, although I've run it on this computer before, so it's a little annoying. So I go back to the question about um, if Urban 1, Urban 2, and Urban 3 do not overlap. So that could be a good thing because that means you've selected probably some spectral, um, some signatures that have some variability. Um, and like I said before, the key to this whole thing is capturing variability within your classes without capturing too much variability. So um, it could be good that you did a good job of collecting three very different signatures. It could be that, um, you know, again, with urban, urban's crazy because it's so heterogeneous that it's easy um, to get very different signatures. Um, and it's, it's very hard to classify urban. So urban in particular is a bit of an, um, an oddball and a challenge. So Sylvia asked a question earlier. It's actually a good question. And Sylvia, I'm sorry we couldn't get your problem um, figured out before. Hopefully we can do that in the next week or so. But when working with imagery, do you need to have knowledge of the area before classification or the spectral variations should be able to tell you this, um, like forest, bare ground, etc.? That's a really great question because I think that's the key to understanding how to do this. With supervised classification, actually I think with any classification, you have to have knowledge of the area before the classification. Um, because you can't 
select training sites and you can't create a land cover classification without understanding what's on the ground. Um, and whenever I teach this class, I, I've taught this class at um, various colleges in the past, I always tell students that it's really, really important um, that you get on the ground and understand what's going on, what you're seeing um, on your computer and how that relates to what you're seeing on the ground. Um, it's really, really important that you do that because um, one, you'll understand what classes you need to classify. Um, and on the ground, you won't sort of understand the spectral variability, but you'll be able to see with your eyes maybe how similar they might be. Um, so you need to do a little bit of both, and that's why I also say um, for the spectral variations, personally, I like to actually run an unsupervised classification first to really get a good idea for the spectral variability in my study area. And then once I do that, I can get a better idea of where there might be spectral confusion between my classes and figure out ways to deal with that. So that's just my own personal way uh, of doing things. And um, so it, it's really an art to try to figure out how to deal with the spectral variability. But it's very, very important that you understand that you know what's going on on the ground. Um, and, you know, field work is the best. But if you can't do that due to limited resources or your, you know, your project is occurring in a completely different country than where you work or something like that, then you can use you know, other things like Google Earth or high resolution imagery or other kind of data um, from people that do know that area. That's kind of a long answer to your question, but I feel fairly strongly about that. So somebody asked when we go for supervised class, when, so when do you do supervised and when do you do unsupervised? Um, the supervised you really do when you know, when you have those training sites. Uh, so when you have information that can give you um, exactly what those training sites are on the ground, then you can do supervised classification. You can actually control I think you can control things a little bit more if you do a supervised, but again, you really have to understand what's on the ground. Um, you can do an unsupervised if uh, you, maybe you don't aren't quite so familiar with the area um, or if you don't have that specific training site information, then you can do an unsupervised. Um, and so obviously, does supervised need further ground truthing? Um, it doesn't need ground truthing after you've already done the first ground truthing, but you do need a lot of ground truthing um, with supervised. So somebody just commented about how they're a water scientist. Um, and I'm glad that land classification is important for calculating surface water discharge. You know, one of the other things that we're um, thinking about doing, because obviously this is focused on on sort of terrestrial systems and not, not um, water. Um, but we can do a similar kind of thing um, with coastal and, and water systems as well. I mean, you don't do the same level of classification, obviously, but there are things um, in and around water that it might be interesting to do as well. So, so make sure that um, you let us know, you know, in the future what would be useful to you. Oh, good. Thank you, Pedro, for responding. So, somebody just asked about the urban classification. A 10 pixel square would cover over 90 meters square on Landsat. Um, so, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of material. Um, even, so, can we use a single pixel ROI to be very specific at what we're classifying? Absolutely. So you, that's a, that's a good way. If you're, if you're trying to classify something like urban, which is so spectrally um, heterogeneous, it's so spectrally mixed, you might want to um, go to the approach of, of selecting an individual pixel. But I tell you, even within, within an urban area, even an individual pixel contains a lot of different, um, um, 
kinds of things on the ground. Um, and it include, include in an urban area, could include vegetation and then all the different sort of land um, surfaces, all of these different things. And, and those pixels still get mixed up with other kinds of land cover types. So that's what makes urban so challenging. This is good. Um, Daniel's going to experiment with using this approach to identify non-native plants. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope that works for you. The one thing with um, trying to get at specific species with Landsat, it's really challenging because um, unless those species are, you have large regions of that species, you know, kind of homogeneous regions, um, plants because the spectral bands of Landsat are fairly broad, um, plants tend to get mixed up with each other. I kind of did an oak and a conifer difference here because spectrally they can be quite different, but sometimes within plants, especially invasive species, um, there can be a lot of confusion between those invasive species and other plant species. Um, however, uh, what a lot of people use is hyperspectral data because the narrow spectral bands allow you to actually sort of pick out different species types. So that's a whole different, processing hyperspectral data is a whole different sort of ball of wax. But um, just to heads up and be aware of, you know, the confusions that might occur with invasives. Somebody said, do urban areas need radar images instead of Landsat images? Um, you could use radar. I mean, you know, radar starts sort of getting at texture a little bit more. Um, so sometimes what people do is combine the radar with the Landsat and um, try to get at urban a little bit more. Um, that's, you know, that's a possibility. Yeah, Slim, you are absolutely right. Slim says um, classification in grasslands is very challenging, especially with dry vegetation. Um, is there any tips to deal with that? <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting that you say that because um, NASA has just funded a project to look at grasslands in Mongolia, actually, and um, it's it will be very challenging for them. I, there's different ways you can kind of get at. Um, you can kind of get at that. Um, the problem is, is the soil has such a high, um, it basically saturates your your signal um, in grasslands and even sort of sparse shrublands and things like that. So sometimes you can you can kind of get at it by looking at um, when those the grasses green up. Um, so for example, in California, um, we have in the winter and the spring, we have green grasses, and then in the summer, we have brown grasses. So you can kind of get at grasslands by looking at these sort of multi-temporal approaches where you have two dates, where you can sort out grasslands from other things. There's also some indices, um, some soil-adjusted vegetation indices and things like that that can try to minimize that soil uh, signal so you aren't getting so much soil signal. So those are all things you can potentially try. Oh, here's a good question. Are there any digital signature files? So basically, are there signatures that exist for every macro class that can be used as ready inputs in, in like an FAO system? You know, so you're, you're kind of what you're looking for is like a, a spectral library, I think. Um, and oftentimes for hyperspectral, there are spectral libraries, but not really for um, multispectral like Landsat. Pretty much everyone just generates their own spectral signatures for their specific region. I think partially because there's so much variation um, between regions. As you can see, even in this region, um, there's, there's so much spectral variation that you can't necessarily get one spectral signature that will encompass one macro class. So somebody's asking about removing clouds. Um, you can actually create cloud masks. And the way that you would do this, you know, one way to do this is to, is to do as we did earlier where you're actually um, 
well, there you can do it spectrally where you select the pixels. You kind of cre like create create training sites for those clouds because the clouds, unless you have snow in your image, um, generally will have a very unique signature. Um, and then once you do that, you create a classification and then use that class. Use um, you you can use raster um, uh, math like a raster calculator to literally. Um, pull out, cut out those pixels from your image and then reclassify your image. There's not much else you can do. You cannot look underneath those clouds. Those clouds are basically blocking out whatever it is underneath them. So you can get rid of them. You can get rid of that part of your image. Um, you can classify them as a separate class. Um, there, there isn't much more you can do about that. So if you've come, uh, just to let you know, if you don't have to stay on for the whole entire time, if you completed the exercise and you don't have any, um, and you don't have any any additional questions, you are more than welcome um, to leave. And I want to thank everybody who's on here for participating in this. This has been a bit of an experiment for us. Um, I'm not leaving right now. I'm just saying this for those of you that want to leave. Um, please feel free. Um, we appreciate all your help. Uh, looks like somebody got an error by with the survey monkey. Let me see what's going on. So somebody was asking about how do you get the minimum and maximum values? So I'm not sure. I think you're going to have to clarify a little bit. Where where do you want to see the minimum and maximum values in the? Do you want to see the minimum and maximum values of the bands, or of the spectral signatures? Maybe you can clarify a little bit. Then I can show you where to get those. Oh, it looks like somebody Antonio had a problem with the the MC classes. You know now that my um, QGIS crashed, I have to bring it up again. So bear with me a minute and I'll bring up QGIS again. Okay, Antonio, I think I have it. I have it back up here. And you wanted to change the MC. I assume you mean that in the signature list here. Um, so I'm able just to select, I think I can, oh, well, yeah, you're right, I can't change it this way. So you know what I would do, probably, in the case of needing to change the MCID? I am not sure how you can do that at this point once it's saved. I think probably what I would do is select it and delete it and then create a new one. So you can select it like this, you can delete it, and then you create a new MCID with the new number, with the number that you want. Oh, Ram says you don't need to delete. Oh, I see. Here we go. So. You're right, Ram. So it looks like if I I actually double clicked in the MCID and then these little buttons came up that I can increase the number. I can change the number in the ROI signature list. Marcus, I think you asked a question about what the homework says. Yes, you can just use the values that you got in the exercise that you use. So I think some of these answers won't have any standard, some of the questions won't have standard answers. It will just depend on what you got yourself. So yes, just use whatever you got. Oh, I see, right, okay. So somebody's asking about the minimum and maximum values when I display the imagery. So I'm gonna click over to the layers panel I'm going to turn off all my training sites and so forth. I'm going to zoom back out. So when I right click, 
on, on the image and I go to properties. Okay, and right now I have band 5, band 4, band 3, and the min-max is listed here. So what you're saying is that in yours the min-max is not listed. You want to make sure also that the contrast en enhancement is, it says stretch to min-max right here. Although if you, if you take that away, the min-max still stays. But you do want to make sure it's stretched to min-max. Min So I, I guess what you're saying is that you're not seeing that min-max in your version. So I'm not sure what the, why not? <laughs> I'm not sure if I can help you with that question. Right, so, okay. It's hard to talk, right, with you writing and me talking. But if you're not seeing the min-max, I don't know why. I wonder if it's the version that you have. Oh, it looks like um, people are being able to answer the question about seeing min-max. So it looks like it's a version issue. No, a version issue, not conversion issue. Version, your version of QGIS. So I'm wondering, can you all see each other's questions? Can you let me know? Because it, it wasn't totally clear. Oh, you're not. Oh, you can't. See, that's one downside to this software is that with the previous software that we used, you could see each other's questions and answers, which was really helpful. So maybe what I can do is if some of you are answering questions, that I verbalize, then I can copy and paste those into the answer section. Hopefully we'll get a version of this software that will, or we'll find another alternative to allow you to sort of talk to each other as well, because a lot of you have some really great solutions to some of these issues that I can't necessarily answer, um, and you have some experiences that would be very helpful for everyone else to hear. So Paolo asked if um, the person with the, I think it's that's Petri, um, that w no, Ryko, with the min-max problem, is there a thumbnail visible? It sounds like there's a, some kind of a drop down that you can select with your version. Hi Ram. Yeah, I um I'm sorry, I left for a few minutes. I'm back now. So you want the spectral distance from signature window. Okay. So I think this is the window that you want. First you have to select the signatures that you want. So if I'm just doing water for example. then you bring up, so if you haven't selected those signatures, then they won't, um, then they won't show up. So let me know if that works for you. Uh, 
Oh, that's interesting, Paolo. So the clipped Calaveras should be a float 32 raster stack. Otherwise, the min-max will not display. So I'm wondering, is that a default, the float 32, when you clip it? That's um, interesting. It should be the default option. Yeah, I agree with you, because I don't think I've had a problem with that, but it could be a version issue. So supposedly the float 32 is the default option. So Ram, I have the spectral signature plot open, I think. Um, and then when you go to spectral distances, you actually have to select your signatures here and then click on spectral distances and they should show up. So hopefully that works for you. Okay, good. So Daniel, Daniel, I'm sorry you're having to get back to the drawing board with week one. So he says, Daniel has to start over because he's getting Python errors on his map and can't select ROIs. You know, I love QGIS. Um, I really do. It has a lot of great functions. Um, but I, it sometimes is really difficult to work with it because of all these errors. So it depends on the, if you have, if you had had Python already, um, installed on your computer, then trying to install QIS, QGIS can kind of get messy, um, and then the version matters, and then as you could see, I may have memory issues, so I was dumped. So it's, you know, it's not perfect. Um, so hopefully you can work, Daniel, hopefully you can work through some of those problems. Hi everyone, this is Cindy again. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in this session. And there's, there's a few of you still left on, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if you're still working on the, um, the lab, the QGIS exercise, um, but if you are, we'll stay on for the last 10 minutes. That's no problem. I just wanted to remind you to complete the Survey Monkey if you get a chance um, and just let us know how you felt about the course and what you'd like to see for future courses and, and that sort of thing. Or if you have any additional questions, just you know post them here and I'll try to answer them. But um, I'll, uh, I'll probably shut down in about 10 minutes or so. Um, and by the way, if you're finished, go ahead and log off. You don't have to stay on till the very end. Um, so we really appreciate your participation in this. This was kind of an experiment for us. And uh, we really hope that you join us again for our next webinar. Okay, I'll log off. I mean, I won't log off to now. for now. I'll, I'll mute for now um, and then come back on and close it down in about 10 minutes. Okay, thanks everyone. And I will put up my email address one more time. There it is. Cynthia L dot L dot Schmidt at NASA.gov. So please feel free to email me any questions you might have. And thanks again for participating. And we'll see you at the next RSAT webinar.